guys even drive a thing through there. Danny stopped the truck, motioned for the kids, and bought them all some ice cream. I'm going to tell you, brother, God will bless you for that a hundred times over. And the church and what we do for God is the same way. The more we give corporately, the more we give to world missions, the more we give to work and get the gospel out of Jesus Christ in this community, the more God will bless us. And he won't just bless us with finances, gold refined. He'll bless us with people and saints and disciples and people to be one to the kingdom of God. It's what it's about. He said, I'll give you white garments, purity and holiness instead of fleshly display that displays your nakedness and lack of protection and modesty and proper standing with God. He said, anoint your eyes with salve that you may see. And I like this one. You know I like this one. Sister Ruby knows what I'm getting ready to say, and Sister Luffman, the rest of you can't quote John 3, 16, but that's beside the point. I hope you can. He said, be zealous. Get your heart back in the direction. Get aggressive with the gospel. Get aggressive with the gospel. Start leaving a track at that table when you go out to a restaurant. Start talking to that waiter or that, that cashier at the grocery store. Start talking to, to, to your mechanic. Start talking and start and, and, just, and, just, and just get out there and say, God, open that door. My dad, every morning, would get up at quarter of five. We weren't supposed to get up until seven. Dad didn't seem to realize how noisy he was. We lived in a pretty small house, three bedrooms, bathroom, kitchen, dining area, little carport. Dad finally built him a garage. That's why he owed Sears so much. He had everything they made. I had to pay for it. Huh? He left the money to pay for it. Dad would get up and pray. And some of the things that he pray, he, he would, he, I don't know why he did this. He'd fix his breakfast and then pray. I, I and he'd pray a long time. I believe I would pray and then fix my breakfast. But he did it that, that way. But something he said that really got my attention. He'd pray for all of us. He'd pray for his boys. He'd pray for his daughter-in-law. At that time, he only had one daughter-in-law. That was my sister-in-law. He'd pray for his grandchildren. He'd ask God to save his brothers. And then he would say this. He'd pray for his pastor. Then he would say this. God, if you'll open a door today for me to tell somebody about you, give me the courage to go to him. God opened that door. He knew he couldn't ram that door open. He knew that if you barge doors open, you can do more harm than good. He also knew that when that door opened, he had a responsibility to walk through it. Sitting in church one Sunday night, my dad wasn't a, a tearful kind of guy. He, I, I saw him cry several times, but not often. Now, Mom, <laughs> she's in tears. But Dad, kind of a stoic person. It was the end of the service. A man and his wife came to the altar. My dad made a beeline down to that altar, put his arms around both of them, began to pray. I'd never seen these people before. It was a Sunday night service. I didn't know who they were, let alone why my dad was down there praying with them. And dad was crying. He was weeping with them. On the way home, I said, Dad, who was those people? He said, oh, son, it's a man I work with. He said he came to me last Monday and told me he was getting a divorce. And I told him, I said, Mr. Terry, have you tried, have you ever thought about trying God? He said, I felt like God was opening a door. And he said, well, we don't go to church often. He said, I want you to come to mine. Hello? Your church. Here. There's nothing to be ashamed of here. Your church. He said, he said, well, he said, he said, before it goes through, Terry, he said, I, I, I want you to please come to my church. And they came. And they came to the altar. And a marriage was put together. And heaven began to rejoice because two souls found Jesus that night. 
when Daddy died, the vice president of the shipyard came to his viewing. He found me and my brother. He a big, tall guy, put his arms around us. He had been my dad's first quarterman. And he said, I want you to know, he said, there's not been a finer Christian man that loved God more out of the 19,000 employees we've got than your father. He said he had a reputation of being quiet, but firm and direct. He said, if you wanted to know anything about Jesus, he'd tell you. He said he has led untold number of people to Jesus in that shipyard. With his testimony, God kept opening those doors. You see, what I'm saying is that, is that there's, a, there's a work to be done here. There's a faithfulness to God, but it doesn't happen if we have an appetite for the world. The condition that they were in. He said, be zealous. And then he says something really strange that caught my attention here. He said, behold... I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and sup with him and he with me. And at first, I, that's beautiful. I've used that in, in personal evangelism. You need to accept Christ. Jesus is standing at the door knocking. Out of context. That's out of context. It's, it's, it's effective, but it's out of context. It's not altogether wrong, but it's out of context. In other words, it doesn't belong in evangelism. He was talking to a church. Why was Jesus on the outside of the door trying to get in? Who locked Jesus out? Are you getting the picture? When a sinner comes and sits in our congregation and doesn't feel the conviction of the Holy Spirit and want to know Jesus, something's wrong. We need to get back where we started from and return to that first love. We need to examine our hearts. God didn't put me here to enjoy every little concert and every little thing in the world. God didn't call me here to like King's Dominion and Bush Gardens, and those things are okay in their place. But on Sunday, I belong here. On Sunday, I belong here with my arms locked with everybody else looking for Jesus to do something. Come on, say amen. Praise the Lord or do something. Amen. You're probably writing a letter telling the pastor we don't need to care pastor anymore. I'm going to skip over to the conclusion because my time is up. But 2 Chronicles 7, 14 is the antidote. And here's what it says. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from, them and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and heal their land. We quote it. Let's take it apart for just a quick moment here. Mary. First he said, if my people. He's not talking about the world. He's not talking about the sinner. Sinner sin and they enjoy it. Until they find Jesus. Then it messes them up, doesn't it? He said, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves Get rid of your pride. Get rid of your idols. Idolatry is one of the great sins of our day. Oh, we don't have golden calves. We got a lot of other stuff. There's a spirit of idolatry that's trying to wean the world away from God. Anything that's deliberate disobedience to God, your addictions are idols. If my people will humble themselves and pray. Now that requires some time. That requires planning. That requires an effort. Get on your knees and pray. I got lazy the other day. I go in my room and, and I, I, I turn my music on and I start to pray. And I was sitting in my chair and I, I, I literally began to weep. And I said, oh God, and God said, excuse me. And I said, Lord, I just, I just want to worship you. He said, what are you doing sitting there? I said, I'm sorry, God. I pushed the chair back. And I got down on the floor, Sister Luffman. Poured my heart out to God. And it seemed like the lower I got, the greater his presence became. Now, that's me. That's not you. 
If they will seek my face and turn from wicked ways, I will hear, I will forgive, and I will heal. Wow. I'm going to ask you a question. Before I do, I want you to join me up in these altars. You know my drill. This is what I do. I'm not Pastor Brian. You get him 50 weeks out of the year. Come on, everybody. Join me up here. I'm not going to bite anybody. Amen. Young people, get as close as you can right up here. My, what a great group of young people we have in this church. This is awesome. This is just a, no, 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 not back there. Up here. Come on, come on, come on, come on. Yikes. Get as close in as you can, everybody, please. 